Welcome to Metahead Christian Fellowship and our online live streamed service. Before we get started, there are a couple of things that we'd like you to know about. If you're accessing this on a Sunday morning between 10 and 11.30, you can take part in a very real way through our live chat option. This allows you to contribute and to communicate with others who are watching the service during the time that we are online. You can also put your prayer requests up, preferably early on in the service, and at the end, we'll gather them all up, and before we close, someone will take time to pray specifically for those needs. Remember, just a first name will do and a brief description. There's no need for for detail, just to protect people's privacy. God knows all the details. You may have personal needs that you don't feel able or that you want to share on the live chat, That's not a problem at all because we have that covered. There is a prayer request button which will link you to one of our prayer team who you can share your request with and they will pray with you one-to-one confidentially and nobody else will be able to see that or to take part in that. If you're accessing this service at any other time through the internet, we have that covered too. Please send your request to office at mcfchurch.co.uk or just ask for someone to contact you. If you leave your contact details, then someone certainly will get in touch. With all that taken care of, let's enjoy all that God has for us today. He has something here for you. Welcome to MCF. Welcome to our meeting today, this morning at Meadowhead Christian Fellowship. Great to see the people in the building. Great to see, well, not see, but gather you're at home watching. Uh, there's a, still a few empty seats. If you wanted to run through the raindrops and you live nearby, we might even be able to squeeze you in this morning. Uh, but great to see everyone. Uh, I'm going to start the service today with, re- with a reading from Psalm 95, and it's an invitation by the guy who wrote the psalm to come and worship God together. So I want to encourage you, whether you're here in the building, whether you're watching at home today or after the event as a recording, to actually get any instruments you've got, get your best singing voice on, and your arms ready to wave and your feet ready to dance, because this is about entering into God's presence. This is about enjoying who God is. This is about rejoicing in the love that he has for us. The psalmist writes this in Psalm 95. He says, Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. There's a bit of vocalizing going on, all right? This is not hushed English singing. This is a bit of vocalizing going on as we worship God together. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. We're going to be doing that. For, why do we do it? For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us bow down in worship. 
Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. Hallelujah. That is good news for you and for me this morning if you know Jesus. We are the pasture of this living God. We're the flock under his care. Father, we want to pray this morning as we come and worship you, as we join with churches across this globe, Lord, worshipping you today. We want to say hallelujah, Lord, because we are yours. We're the sheep of your pasture. We're the flock under your care. And we say thank you, God. And we want to express that to you today in word, in song, in prayer, and in our actions, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. There we go. Praise unbroken, praise unending, be yours, be yours forevermore. Praise unbroken, praise unending, be yours, be yours forevermore. Praise unbroken, praise unbroken.
I just had a picture of a like a fire poker, you know, one of those old metal things you poke in the embers to see what's still there. Uh, and I just feel for some of us this morning, and me included, and you watching at home, that actually some of us feel like we're a bit of embers when it comes to worshipping God with everything that's gone on and all that's happened. Uh, and we're kind of wondering, you know, this isn't how I want to worship God. There's just embers. But I think the Father would come to us this morning in his love, in his mercy, and in his grace. And he's poking the embers in us. Not to kind of go, mm, there's not a lot there. But in his love, he's poking the embers. And you know what? He's blowing on those embers in your life. He's blowing on those embers in my life. And he's blowing to fan them into flame again. And as we worship him, there's the opportunity for us to respond and say, yes, Lord, I choose to let you fan into flame worship. I choose, Jesus, to fan into flame worship of you because of your love. I'd like us just to sing this song again, if we can, if that's all right, Erica. And, uh, and let's respond to what God is doing in your heart and in my heart right now. And right now as you're watching, what God is doing and saying to you, let's respond. This is an opportunity for us. And let that, that, that poker, know that the hand on the end of that poker, poking around in the embers, is the hand of God. 
the hand of a loving father, the hand of a father who wants to draw worship from his children, from the sheep in his pasture, from the flock under his care. Let's worship. There's nothing worth more than will ever come close. There's nothing compared. You're our living home. Your presence. I've tasted and seen of the greatest of loves, where my heart becomes free and my shame is. Come flood this place.
say you are welcome here, Lord. You're welcome in our lives. You're welcome, Lord, into our hearts. Lord, you're welcome into our minds, into the deep recesses of our minds. Lord, you're welcome into what makes us tick. Father, you're welcome into the unseen things that we show no one else or tell no one else. Lord, you're welcome here into our lives. Lord, we're broken. We're sinful. We're a mess. But, oh God, you love us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, you're welcome here into, into our lives, Lord. You're welcome into our homes, even as we watch this. Lord, you're welcome into this building as we sit here and stand here and worship you too. Lord, you're welcome into these streets around us. Father, we've been singing your glory, Lord, is what our heart longs for. And Lord, we long for your glory in our own lives, that in just some tiny way we could begin to mirror Jesus. Oh God, come and have your way. Lord, your glory, Lord, is what our heart longs for in our homes, in how we bring up our children, in how we look after our aging relatives, in how we function as families. Lord, your glory, Lord, is what our heart longs for, in how we do our work, Lord, in how we look for work. Your glory, Lord, is what our heart longs for. Lord, in the mission and the purpose you've called us to, Father, your glory is what our heart longs for. We pray for the streets of Jordan Thorpe and Batemore and Low Edges. More than that, Lord, we pray for the homes up and down those streets. Your glory, Lord, is what our heart longs for. God, these are big prayers. And we can't do it. And that's so good, because you can. But you choose to use us, Lord. You choose to love us. You choose to care for us. You choose to put your Holy Spirit in us. You choose to have your son die for us. And we say, hallelujah. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Your glory, Lord, is what our heart longs for. Amen, Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Amen. Amen. Great. Uh, just uh, a few notices this morning. Actually, just three. So, um, f first of all, without wishing to embarrass anyone, but it is great to see John and Sheila back in the building this morning. You won't realise that at home. Uh, sat right underneath the prime camera, so you can't see them. But John and Sheila are back in, which is great, and it's lovely to see you. And happy birthday, John, as well. 85 today, I gather. Happy birthday to you. That's great. So, uh, which is lovely. Um, slightly different tack <laughs> after that. So the prayer walk after church today is cancelled due to the weather. Not that we're fair weather Christians, but that we have seen the weather. So there's no prayer walk this Sunday, okay, mm. after church. Uh, and Nick is speaking at New Life Mexpra uh, this Sunday as well. It'd be good to remember that. Jonathan, I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you. We don't normally do things like this, but uh, different people have been... Uh, saying to me, it's a special birthday for a certain lady today. And so, um, I mean, we don't actually mention a lady's birthday, but I see she's blazoned on a badge, which has given the days away, really. So, oh, is it? Did she really? I, well, I won't give you her actual age, apart from to say it's the year of Jubilee for, uh, for Erica. So uh, we just want to just say thank you for all that she's been doing during lockdown in particular. Many of you might not know about just the services and, uh, and her involvement in different families. People have come to us and said, look, it's a special birthday. Can't we do something for her? So there's a card and a little uh, thing for you. So thank you, Erica. Aww. Happy birthday. It's a plant. <laughs> <laughs> I know how much gardening they do.
Eric are embarrassed, really. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, so we're going to watch a uh, children's uh, movie this morning now, and it's, we get double today. So there's two children's movies to watch. If you're watching at home, I just want you to tell me at the end, in the second movie, how many fingers does the shepherd have? Oh. <laughs> Lost and found a missing coin. Here is a woman. She has ten silver coins. She likes to count them. One, two, three. Oops, silly cat. Now they've gone all over the place. The cat doesn't care. He has stretched out and gone to sleep. The woman counts her silver coins again, but there are only nine. Bother, one of them's missing. Never mind, it can't have gone far. Perhaps it's under the rug. No, there's no sign of it there. She searches and she searches, but she can't find any coin anywhere. She even looks inside her pots and pans, even though she really knows it can't be in there. She's making so much noise, she's woken up a cat. <gasps> there it is, the cat was lying on it all that time. I found it! The woman laughs, she's so happy. She calls her friends to tell her the good news. How many? Three. three, yeah, three fingers. It's very unnerving. That's a, that's a, a great videos, thank you. And thank you to the Grease family again for that great Lego video. Fantastic. Uh, we're going to take up our offering now. Uh, so there's a little video explaining how we do that today. And then we're going to uh, play through a song while we take that up, all right? Thanks very much.
Okay, just double checking. Moon and stars, they went. The morning sun was dead. The savior of the world was fallen. His body on the cross, his blood poured out for us. The weight of every curse was broken. time of communion together now so if you're watching at home this is the time to quickly get that bread and wine or juice um and it's one of the great things that we can do even at this time when some are here and many are watching at home still is actually we can be the church taking communion together even if we're not physically in the same room at the same time and it's a great that uh, we've been able to do this so steve very kindly is going to lead us in communion on a, on a video we're going to watch together so if you're here in the building the bread and the wine hopefully is next to you or under your seat uh, for yourselves uh, and then hopefully you've got some at home as well and we're just going to remember 
Jesus' death and, he, and his second coming as we celebrate this communion together. Thanks. As we come to share communion now, let's look at a passage from Ephesians chapter 2, starting with verses 1 to 3. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. This is the bad news of the reality facing everyone, us included, before we're rescued from a life of sin, set free from offending against a pure and holy God. As Paul writes in Romans, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It's easy to gloss over this because it's an uncomfortable truth for us to face. But to truly appreciate the extravagance and extraordinary generosity of what comes next, we must really understand the darkness of the place we were in, that we all without exception were deserving of God's anger and judgment. We were spiritually bankrupt, unable to contribute anything at all to our salvation. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. Because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. Sometimes people talk about how they found Jesus, but the truth, though, is that it's always God who finds us. The parables of the lost sheep and the lost coin that Jonathan will be looking at later illustrate this so clearly for us. As John writes in one of his letters, This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. So when we wander off like sheep number 100, it's God who comes looking for us. When we were trapped before we were even aware of our need, God was already out searching for us. And amazingly, when we were dead in transgressions, God made us alive with Christ. And not just for this life, but for eternal life. The transition from death to life has already happened. To pick up Jesus' words on the cross, it is finished. And it's all God's grace. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good work, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So the first two chapters of Ephesians describe an extravagant God who expresses extraordinary love and grace towards us now and plans to, do, to express it even more so in the future. But this is not just for our benefit or enjoyment. As we share this bread and wine, the intention is not simply that we experience a sort of satisfied glow, bit like what those of a certain age would remember as the ready bread glow. No, there is a much bigger plan at play here, a much bigger purpose at work. See, God has prepared good works for us to do, works that show the incomparable riches of his grace, expressed in our kindness to others, to our families, our friends and our communities. There's a strong connection here to the Great Commission that we've been studying recently. Let's go back to what John said earlier. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. And Paul wrote these words to the church in Corinth. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he given thanks, he broke it, and said, This is my body, broken for you. Do this, remembrance of me. The same way after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it, remembrance of me. 
For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray. Father, we want to start by acknowledging our failings and our sins before you and to confess those things uh, that we've done. Father, in the silence now, just accept the confessions of our hearts. And Father, we want to thank you for your incomparable grace and mercy, that extravagant love which forgives all our sins and cleanses us from all unrighteousness, making us alive with Christ. And this all achieved through the sacrifice of Jesus, the breaking of his body and the pouring out of his blood, which are represented by this bread and this wine. Fathers, we eat and drink now. Seal again this truth in our hearts, we pray. Amen. So as we share these simple elements of bread and wine together now, let's consider what they represent. The incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kind, kindness to us in Christ Jesus and through us to our families, our friends and our communities. Let's finish by reading a few of those verses again. God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Amen. Thanks, Steve, for leading us in that. That's great. So just before Jonathan comes and speaks, we're just going to pray for him. Um, Father, we want to pray uh, for your word again today. Lord, you know, we settle our hearts before you and uh, pray, Lord, that you would speak to us. Just pray you give Jonathan a sense of peace and your presence with him right now and a confidence in you, Lord, that this message is for us today. And we pray, Lord, for your Holy Spirit to be at work in us, that the message will land uh, where it needs to land in each one of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Hello everyone. Um, today we're going to look at the subject of being lost and found and it's taken from these two stories we've seen already, the lost sheep and the lost coin. Uh, they are, if you want to read at home and check this, I'm telling you the truth, well the truth as far as I know it, then uh, it's in Luke chapter 15 verses 1 to 10. Just as an introduction, confession to make. Now I'm slightly OCD in my temperament. My wife might think I'm more than slightly that way inclined. That's obsessive compulsive disorder. Now it doesn't appear in everything. I don't have to have all the cutlery lined up and all the and, and you know the volume at an even number and things like that that a lot of these people have. But when I lose something, I get really obsessive. I cannot rest until I find it. It doesn't really matter whether I need it or whether it's that important. If I've lost something, I just can't settle until I've found it. I will search everywhere. And I can get more and more frantic and more and more worked up until I find this blessed thing, whatever it is. It is not usually a blessed thing in my mind at the time. But, but I, you know, I, I, it, just be, it just works on my mind in such a ridiculous way. Now, I wouldn't necessarily say, because of course God doesn't get, ups, doesn't get frantic and doesn't get worked up like that, but, but the essence of this story tells us about how obsessive God is about mission, in the sense of he is determined, resolute. We read about Jesus setting his face as a flint towards Jerusalem, you know, determined to go through with a sacrifice for the sake of the sins of mankind. And these stories talk about people who will not give up until they have rescued that which is lost. And in that sense, God is like that. Um, so perhaps I can, I can be quite pleased about my temperament at some times. <laughs> now, I'm not alone in losing things. I guess if we all put our hands up in this room, we'd say that. Apparently, I read that the average person in the UK loses over 3,000 things in their lifetime. Now, how does anyone remember that anyway? 
I mean, some of the things I've lost, I wouldn't even know I've lost until I'm looking for them. So essentially, I don't know how they come up with these figures, but they do. What are the most usual things we lose? Who's ever lost keys? Yeah. Their phone? Yes. Glasses? Well, those are the top three in the UK. Those are the three things we lose. If you don't wear glasses, you can add another one to that. Um, umbrellas are fairly high up the list, too, and I never, I never had an umbrella. Apparently, people lose about 64 umbrellas in their lifetime. I have no idea where. I read that Travel Lodge, the famous hotel chain, talk about some of the weirdest things that people have lost in their hotels. Now, I mean, now this does take some thinking about. Somebody lost a 27-feet model space rocket. 27 <laughs> foot high. Now, I mean, uh, I, I, you, it makes you wonder. Somebody lost a, a Christmas tree fully decorated. Um, people have lost their mobility scooters. Well, how do you lose a mobility scooter? <laughs> the very definition is you probably need it to get around anyway, but they lost it. Um, Ah, there are uh, life-size cutouts of uh, Ryan Gosling and Brad Pitt. The women would never lose those. I'm sure it was doing a man. And, and I could go on. Well, the most weird thing was somebody lost a bath full of Jersey New Potatoes. <laughs> Leave that one with you. This is in the UK, by the way. Um, other things, though, I guess, I guess getting lost is something that I'm quite used to, too, because my sense of direction is terrible. I genuinely thank God for a sat-nav even though the annoying voice telling me to turn around whenever I can, uh, whenever possible, does get on my nerves, I think. But the thing that I've, I was reflecting on is that most of the time, you're not aware that you're lost until somebody tells you that you're lost or something happens to make you realize that you're lost. Um, then it becomes apparent. Do you know, there's many, many people in our country who are lost. They're in a state of being lost, and they have no idea yet. They don't realize that that is the truth. Have you ever been lost as a child? We had a man that used to come to our church called Horace many years ago, an old man that used to, he was very, very old when he came. He was a great singer, loved singing, but he got lost as a little child in, uh, in, in Sheffield, and as a result of that, he had a stammer for the rest of his life. He struggled with a stammer, and yet when he sang, he used to love singing Onward Christian Soldiers was his favorite hymn. You know, he sang perfectly. I was lost as a little child in, in Darlington, in Woolworths. That's for people of a certain age, because no, they no longer exist, do they? Um, and I remember, it might have only been five or ten minutes, but the dread of being somewhere and suddenly your parents aren't there. It's a terrible thing. But I think there is something more terrible. It happened in Canterbury to Karen and I a number of years ago when our kids were little. Um, Alice would be probably just preschool or just attending school. James would be getting towards the end of junior school. And we were shopping in the pedestrian center of Canterbury. And I thought they were with Karen and Karen thought they were with her. And we spent about 20 minutes going round our tracks from shop to shop. I was about to talk to the police. I was getting frantic. Where are the kids? This was, this was one of the longest 20 minutes of my life. And then I thought to myself, James, being a sensible young man, will have gone back to the car maybe. The car was half a mile away, and it was crossing a busy road too. And yes, he'd retraced his steps to the car. Um, and we met them about half an hour later, and you can't, I can't tell you about my, my relief. I worked as a prison chaplain in a maximum security prison at that time, and I'd read plenty of stories. The, the relief was something that I can't begin to tell you about. Being lost, a parent loving their children. God seeking and searching that which is lost until it's found. So we've got these three stories about lost and found in Luke chapter 15. And in many ways, they're an answer. Well, not in many ways. They are, in, in essence, an answer to criticism from the religious leaders of the day. If you start that chapter, you'll find that the problem was that Jesus didn't fit into the model of organized religion that was happening in those times. He associated with people who were contaminated by sin, whose lifestyles were unacceptable to the religious of their, their day. They were called tax collectors and sinners. Well, tax collectors might be unpopular nowadays, but they were really unpopular then, I can tell you. They collected taxes for the Romans, who at that time uh, ruled over the Jews and, and were hated. It was a bit like being an occupied country. 
And they got rich out of doing so too. So people were, didn't like tax collectors. Sinners is kind of a generic term. There's a posh word for you. But it covers the whole idea of people who don't live very moral lives or perhaps people who are in jobs that made it incompatible for them to keep the Jewish law. And the, the critics of Jesus, the religious elites, are muttering. Somebody's translated that, that verse as kept grumbling. This man, this man, they say in a kind of disparaging, derisory, dismissive way, this man welcomes such people. I mean, what kind of church would it be if we welcomed people like that? It'd be appalling, wouldn't it? Sorry, I mean, please God help us to. You know, but, but it, 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 it's, and it's interesting, if you read this, that the challenge was that Jesus was actually gathering such people around him. These people... <laughs> That, that for the religious uh, elites would say that no self-respecting man of God would associate with such people, let alone socialize with them and eat with them. Um, you know, Jesus is gathering these kind of people. They're listening to his life-giving message because he was offering hope to people which organized religion of the day was not offering anything but condemnation to and Jesus as often responds to the criticism of the religious leaders by doing a Max Bygraves. I'm going to tell you a story. The lost sheep. Well, actually, I've done this, and it's not as easy as it sounds. It's not as joyful. I mean, I've got five fingers still, but I could have lost <laughs> it a couple, because sheep can be really brutal at times. It, I worked on a farm in North Yorkshire. It was winter. There was snow on the ground. I'm not making this up, I promise you. And a sheep, an old sheep that was blind, was trapped with its horns entangled in one of the wire fences, the other side of a stream. We walked across the fields, you know, a bit like good King Wenceslas, you know, we're walking through the snow um, to get to this sheep that was stranded and would die. And actually, we came to the stream. And the only way of getting across this stream, I, I kid you not, was across two railway lines. They were, the, they were the helpful things that were put there that were about that far apart. And I'm shuffling across like this with snow on the ground across about four or five feet above a stream that was fairly deep. Um, not the kind of thing. I wouldn't have drowned in it, but I didn't really want to get wet in the middle of winter. Um, and I get to this sheet. And was it pleased to see me? Was it thump? It started kicking and butting and moving around and being agitated, you know, and, uh, and uh, you know, you can't say there, there, little sheepy, you know, kind of. It wasn't as smiley as that one on the, on the well, I'll tell you. Anyway, we managed to untangle its horns. And because this thing was just like it was, you know, it had a hold of its fleece. Sorry, Sheila, you love sheep, don't you? So I've got to be careful what I say. Uh, you know, uh, we, well, the only way to take it was to carry it on my shoulders, so this old ewe, um, that's, that's a name for a sheep, by the way, <laughs> was basically on my shoulders with me holding two front legs in one hand, two back legs in another one, smelling beautiful, as you can imagine. Uh, lighter than I thought, though. And I had to shuffle back across the stream like this and then carry it up through, you know, it wasn't deep snow drifts, but through some so till I got it home. Was it happy when it got home? Was it thump? You know, I mean, honestly, I'd saved its life. It wasn't that particularly bothered about it. It wasn't that keen to be rescued. But the truth is, we went after it. And although that didn't show any lot of gra gratitude to it, uh, we saved its life. The man in the story has a flock of 100 sheep. The um, Jewish writers of the day say the average size of a flock of sheep was somewhere between 20 to 200. So this was quite a biggish flock. You'd think you could possibly afford to lose one, wouldn't you? But Jesus tells the story of a good shepherd. He's not called a shepherd in this story, called a man, actually. But it's obvious he's a shepherd because he owns these sheep. Going after the lost sheep until he finds it. That's the words that Jesus uses. And he's so intent on finding that which is lost, this one sheep, that he leaves 99 sheep in the open country. Not in a sheepfold. Now, this wasn't a day and age where there were fences, where there were fields, where there were enclosures. You know, like you see across North Yorkshire, where I come from, the dry stone walls. This was open country. And he leaves 99 in the open country to go after one. It seems crazy. 
But the focus, the resolute determination was to go after that one sheep. Jesus is telling us that God actively seeks out sinners to bring them back. It's his mission. It's his focus. He takes the lead. He takes the initiative. Now, the connection to God and a shepherd would be well known to the critics who are listening to Jesus, well known to the Jews who are listening to the story. We all know, I think most of us know in Britain, uh, Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. But in Ezekiel chapter 34, Ezekiel is one of the prophets in the Old Testament, you have a whole passage about sheep and about shepherds. And there's an, a, the verse there that would be well known to Jesus and well known to the critics who were listening that day too. too. Ezekiel 34 verses 11 to 12 says this, these words. This is what the sovereign Lord says. I myself will search for my sheep and look after them. As a shepherd looks after his scattered flock when he is with them, so I will look after my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places where they were scattered on a day of clouds and darkness. Now, in many ways, he's talking about the Jews from around the world, but there's a sense of knowing God seeking and saving that which was lost. The lost coin is the next story. Whereas a sheep might stand for one of the Jews, you know, we are the sheep of his fold, we are the Jewish nation. It's interesting here, we find a woman who's lost a coin. The coin is in the original a drachma. A drachma is a Greek coin. Greeks were often the word used for Gentiles. Now, perhaps this might have been lost on the crowd, but it's quite interesting that Jesus would use a lost Gentile coin uh, as, as something that he was seeking after too. But there's this woman... And, uh, gosh, as I was starting to think about this on Friday, I lost my phone. I knew it was somewhere in the house. And nothing else mattered to me till I found it. I told you what I was like, wasn't I? I knew it must be here somewhere, I said to myself. And it's a bit like the woman. Well, I know it must be somewhere here. Have you ever said that yourself? I know it's somewhere around. Um, and so she goes after this Greek coin, this, this, uh, this drachma. And these ten, these 10 coins, some people have thought might have been her dowry uh, from her marriage. Others thought it might be her savings. We don't know. All we know is that this one coin was a day's wage for a, a laborer in those days. But we do know her reaction to the problem of losing the coin. She makes, uh, Jesus says, a careful search of the house. She puts in effort. She lights a lamp. Now, we might think, well, is this at night? Well, it might have been at night, but houses in the Middle East are dark because they don't have many windows because actually that lets in the heat. And, uh, you know, they want to keep, the, to keep them as cool as possible. She lights a lamp so she can find it. She basically sweeps the rushes and the straw which would be on the floor, strewn on the floor. She works determinedly, Jesus says, until she finds the coin. And like the shepherd, she doesn't give up until she gets or finds what she's looking for. As with the farmer, the effort's worth it. That which was lost is found. So what is Jesus illustrating to us from these stories? First, I think he tells us that the lost are worth all the effort we put in to rescue them. Each individual is important. One lost coin one lost sheep, one lost son that we'll hear about next week. Each individual is precious and valuable. And that there is such a relief and joy when they're found, like the relief and joy that I, when I found James and Alice in Canterbury at a car park that day. Such a relief. Secondly, in these stories, neither the shepherd nor the woman wait for the lost to turn up. They're not just praying for them. Lord, show us where they are. No, I've tried that one, by the way. <laughs> and sometimes God does answer. But they go after the lost. They're on a rescue mission. God doesn't want us to be passive about, uh, you know, people waiting for people to come home. I used to have a song, you know, um, come home, come home, you that are weary, come home, praying for them to come home. And it's good that we pray for people to come home, but actually it takes more than just our prayers. Um, you know, nothing else matters to this woman or the shepherd until they 
they recover that which was lost. It takes their priority. It's the important thing in their lives. The shepherd leaves his flock. The woman cleans her house. Um, they go after the lost. They don't just cry out for them. Oh, sheep, come home. Where are you, little coin? Come on. Uh, they actually, they, they seek them. They find the lost where they are, in their lost state. They don't find them. They don't suddenly turn up somewhere where you can find them. They actually go out to where they're lost. There is a real movement towards people who are lost. It's not just a sense of waiting for the lost to turn up on our doorstep. Thirdly, did you, the rejoicing aspect of this. Now, a few weeks ago, I spoke on the, as part of this series on the Great Omission, or the Great, uh, which is a parody on the Great Commission. Just go back over the weeks if you've missed a few, <laughs> you'll catch up. Um, I spoke on the 72 and the rejoicing that Jesus had, you know, when people came back from mission and were saying, the people rejoiced as well because they'd been on mission and they'd seen what God had done. And I said, you know, if you want to know joy in your life, if you want to know real life coming back into your Christianity, well, get out there and get, get into mission because that becomes really exciting. And it's where you find joy in your relationship. Jesus says... More rejoicing in heaven. <laughs> More rejoicing in heaven. It talks about the angels rejoicing in heaven, like the angels are having a party. There is rejoicing over the lost repenting. Now, this word isn't really brought out in these two, in these two uh, stories. It will be more in the, in the next one about the lost son. Because it's very difficult for a coin to repent of being a coin or a sheep to repent of being a sheep. But essentially, the idea is that there is a turnaround in these people's lives. There is a turning to God. But there is more rejoicing, Jesus says, over a sinner coming to faith than 99 righteous people. Now, have you thought about that? This is a bit provocative for us. But heaven is more excited by one person that we bring to the Lord than all the rest of our services put together. Makes you think, doesn't it? And God loves worship, and I love worship. But this, is, this will make the heart of God glad, <laughs> because that's his mission. Somebody said, man's misery in being lost contrasts with God's joy in finding him. So in conclusion... We know some more about the shepherd. We know that uh, the good shepherd lays down his life for, for the sheep, for the lost sheep as well, Jesus said. And Isaiah 53 vividly illustrates the suffering that Jesus went through for us on the cross. In verse 6 we read, We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him, that's on Jesus, the sin or the iniquity of us all. And in Hebrews 12, the writer to the Hebrews says these words, let's fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. What was the joy set before him? Our rescue, our recovery, our return, the lost being found. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now Jesus' mission was not comfortable for the religious of his day. He associated and mixed with the kind of people the religious rulers would have nothing to do with. They would say, bad company corrupts good character. Steer clear of the, them. They're, they're unworthy. They're unclean. They're unloved. They're unwanted. You know, separate from the lost. We used to, when I first became a Christian, I guess, you know, we were Pentecostals, it was all about separation from the world, you know. Now, there needs to be a distinctive about how we live in the world, being in the world but not of it. But being in the world is so very, very important for us as Christians. Jesus kind of is challenging that whole mindset of separation in these stories. He says God's chosen to take the initiative in rescuing that which is lost. He's made the first move. He's made it all possible. Why? Because it's his will, it's his purpose, and what's more, he delights in doing so. And he invites and expects us as his followers to be involved in this great commission, to be like him, to seek to fulfill his will on earth as it is in heaven.
Amen. God bless you. Great word, Jonathan. We do really need to take that. I encourage you to listen to it again. I will. Um, I need to hear that. And uh, But now we're coming to our time of prayer. We've got uh, some prayer requests. But first of all, it's always good to give thanks for answered prayer. I think last Sunday we prayed for Anne Simpson. Anne Simpson um, uh, undergoing cancer treatment. But she'd had a, a tummy bug, I think, for about nine days. And I think she was taken into hospital and we prayed for her. Well, since then, uh, she was um, discharged from the hospital. And I believe now she's on holiday. So I think that's a pretty good answer to prayer, isn't it? Praise God. Let's give thanks to God. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. We do have some uh, specific requests. Um, I want to pray for uh, a person called Jane. Um, she fell and uh, broke a femur. She's had surgery, but cannot bear, wait bear for three weeks, and she's looking at a three months recovery. Father, in this situation, we want to pray for your presence to come. Father, make yourself known. Father, as it were, seek her out. Uh, Father, and we want to pray for a complete and speedy recovery uh, to the uh, injuries that she's had and to the surgery that's taken place. We also want to pray for Alan, one of our members, uh, diagnosed with bladder cancer. It's not inverse invasive, but it could spread. The request is that in two to three weeks, the time of his next visit that the tumour has not spread, has not grown. Father, we want to pray for Alan and the family at this time. Father, I want to pray that you would come upon him uh, with mighty healing power. Father, and, and, and again, we just want to pray and say to this uh, tumour to, to stop growing. And Father, I want to pray that the tumour would begin to shrink. Lord, do it in your mighty name for your glory, we pray. We also want to pray for Ros, another of our member, who is going to have minor surgery um, on Thursday to remove uh, skin cancer. And again, we just want to pray for Ros. We want to pray for that sense of your encouragement and your presence with her at this time as she has to go in into a time of uh, isolation in preparation for that. We want to pray for a successful um, uh, a successful uh, operation and that her recovery will be quick and complete. We also pray for Anne, uh, Linda's sister. Uh, we all know Linda, member of the church here. Linda had to call uh, 111 and a nurse uh, was sent on her way. Anne has bowel cancer, which has now spread to her liver. Again, Father, we want to pray for your presence and peace for Anne and the family at this time. Again, we want to pray against the pain uh, that she's suffering and pray against the cancer tumour growth in her body. Lord, shrink it, we pray. I want to pray for Kaz, uh, a lady in a cycling race yesterday and had an accident, a cycle crash, and badly injured her face, broken jaws, lost and broken teeth, awaiting surgery today or tomorrow. Father, again we pray for your presence to be with, with Kaz and her family at this time. Father, I want to pray that you would remove the pain and the discomfort that she's currently under at the moment, and that you would bring healing through the successful operation to the jaw and her teeth. And finally, we want to pray for Malcolm, 
who is suffering from Parkinson's disease and the condition is rapidly deteriorating. Father, we want to pray for Malcolm at this time. We pray that you would make him comfortable and that um, for his wife, under a great deal of pressure and stress, our Father, I want to pray for your peace to come into that situation. Make yourself known. Show your power at this time. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Roland. Just as Erica and the team get ready to lead us in the last couple of worship songs, I wonder if we can... Can we, can we just stand, um, if you're here in the building or even at home, I'd like us just to pray together as a church, really, in response to, to what we've heard this morning from, from Jonathan. And, uh, and this, this very notion of how passionate God is about pursuing that which is lost. You know, we, we're all here today, and you're here watching this, I guess, most of us, right? Because God passionately pursued you and me. Uh, and I think, you know... And we live in the good of that. Uh, but it's kind of a two-way thing, isn't it? He's passionately pursued us that we may be caught up with him, passionately pursuing the rest, if you like, of the lost. Uh, and, it's a, and it's a big ask, because actually a lot of us today, you know, we find that difficult. There are challenges, and it's easy to come up with things why we might not do it as vigorously, perhaps, as we used to, or, or whatever. But, but I just think it is such a key part of the mission, and it starts not with a sense of legalism, not with a sense of duty, but with a father who is passionate for you and for me and passionate for those that are lost, that he may find them. Let's just pray, can we? Yeah. Father, I want to thank you for your great love for this world. You know, that so well-known verse that God loved the world so much that he gave his only son, Jesus, that whoever believes in him won't perish but have everlasting life. And you haven't stopped loving the world so much, Lord. You don't love it any less. In fact, you know, you love it just as much as when you gave your only son. And we want to pray, Father. We want to thank you, Lord, that you, there was a day when you chose us, when you caught up with us. Uh, and maybe perhaps we're a little bit more like the sheep in Jonathan's story and we kicked and screamed and weren't happy about it at first. But Lord, when we, when we realized what a love you have for us and who you are and we surrendered to you, Lord, and we say thank you so much, God, that you pursued us and came to find us. But Lord, we recognize still today, you're still the God who pursues. You're still the God that seeks that which is lost. And you've caught us up with that same plan and that same purpose. So Lord, I pray, Father, in these days that you would stir our hearts, cause us to seek your face, Lord, for the lost from these Tories, Lord. Cause us to seek your face for, for, uh, in the communities around us, in our friendships, and our families, Lord. And to, not just to pray, yes, to pray, but also, Lord, to, to pursue with passion, whatever that may mean for us, Lord, whether it's saying something, whether it's just in how we act and live. God, I pray, put in our hearts that same desire that is from you to pursue that which is lost. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks, Eric.
are suffering, that are lost. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over that situation. Amen. Father, we want to thank you uh, for your word today. Well, I want to thank you for lifting the, our eyes and our gaze away from us to a much bigger thing that's going on, a much bigger purpose that you're doing and that you're about. And Lord, we want to pray today, Lord. We want to pray, come, Lord Jesus, and build your church. Come, Lord Jesus, and rescue that which is lost. Come, Lord Jesus, uh, and bring about a change, Lord, in our society, in our communities, in our families, in our workplaces, in our neighbourhoods. Lord, what a massive thing you've called us to, Lord. But it is your plan and your purpose. And so, Lord Jesus, we just stand here today as your servants. God, help us. God, stir us. God, lift our eyes out of our own little navels and our own little worlds into what you are doing and the massive thing that you're calling us to this week and as we go forward from this place in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Amen, everybody. Great to see you. Let's finish by saying the grace together, shall we? The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen. Have a great week.